What was the first anime you watched? Depending on your age, location, and what shows were available, the answer can change dramatically. Even just in America, a few television producers determined what that anime was for millions of Americans. But how do they know which anime to put on television? Alternatively, how does a producer get a massive audience into a diverse and culturally contrasting medium like anime? For Western producers, the answer was based on what influenced them, what their first anime was. Speed Racer had a major influence on Toonami's James DeMarco, which led to Toonami airing Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon. But for Fred Ladd, the producer that brought Astro Boy to America, there was no anime he could point to. He brought the first anime to the West. He could have never known that buying a cheap property from a foreign animation studio would snowball into what is now a $19 billion industry. From Astro Boy to modern blockbusters such as Demon Slayer, this is how anime changed the world. In September of 1963, Astro Boy became the first anime television show to debut in America. While the first anime to be brought to America was actually Three Tales, an anthology of three Japanese children's stories, Astro Boy was the anime that opened the gate for America. Fred Ladd had seen the popular manga and anime in Japan and painstakingly worked with NBC to bring it to the US. Astro Boy was met with huge popularity for a foreign animated television series, and also a host of criticisms. Parents described their distaste for Astro Boy, pointing to their dislike to the idea of a cartoon character having human traits and feelings. After all, in America, animation was mostly focused on round characters like Bugs Bunny and the Flintstones, with storylines that were, for lack of a better word, cartoonish. Critics panned the series for limited animation, but more importantly, it was cheap. To cut costs, the team had to cut the number of drawings, trim the lines in each image to the bare minimum, and simulate movement as much as possible without any additional drawings. But Astro Boy was still very successful, and American producers brought Speed Racer to the West in 1967. The anime was drastically improved in terms of production and animation quality. Suddenly, America was introduced to weekly action, where most shows would focus on lighthearted comedy. Although Speed Racer was criticized for reused shots and poor dubbing, He's going over that cliff. Ah! the action storylines and production value was so much greater than Astro Boy that fans were mesmerized by the show. As anime started to grow in the West, most were oblivious to the fact that the source of the anime had been drastically altered for Western appeal. Peter Fernandez, the producer, writer, and literal voice of Speed Racer for the West, constantly changed names, altered storylines, and outright removed content. The general feeling from American producers was that these changes needed to happen in order for audiences to accept the series. However, it was the serialized storytelling of anime that grew its American audience. In shows like Scooby-Doo and the Jetsons, all stories were episodic. Each episode was formulaic, with all conflict resolved by its end. On Astro Boy and especially Speed Racer, stories were ongoing. The answer to a mystery might unfold over weeks or even months, hooking in viewers. American producers, seeing the potential in serialized storytelling, started to shift away from rewriting plot lines in the 70s. With a sensation that was Star Wars, science fantasy and space operas suddenly became extremely popular, with anime like Star Blazers capitalizing on the trend. Originally, Space Battle Yamato in Japan, it debuted in 1978 and took serialized storytelling to another level in America. Stories would take dozens, if not over a hundred episodes to properly unfold. With the early successes of Speed Racer and Star Blazers, more diverse anime was brought to the West in the early 80s, including anime that focused on a young female audience rather than male, with shows like Honey Honey. Space fantasy anime like Voltron and Robotech were brought over to the West as well. Serialized storytelling had become the focus for American producers, but the westernization still continued in full force. Voltron saw heavy westernization when a major character's death was avoided to hilarious effects. There's a doctor on planet Ebb. 
get me there fast. But the true Frankenstein's monster was Robotech, an anime that took three unrelated animes together and spliced them into a hybrid Americanized anime. Super Dimension Fortress Macross was turned into the first Robotech War, where humans would meet the giant alien Zentraudi. Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross would then have Robotech Masters come to Earth and plant the Flower of Life, which would then attract the alien Invid in the final generation, the anime Genesis Climber Mos Piata. Even with this Frankensteining, the anime kept the adult approach, strong storylines, and character love triangles, which actually led it to be a major hit among adult women as much as their children. With over two decades of anime now shown in the West, a dedicated fan base had emerged. For anime not officially distributed in English, anime and manga were very difficult to obtain until the immense step up in home video technology. Suddenly, anime could be imported and properly shown in original Japanese through VHS copies. Dedicated fans started to create unofficial fan subs for their favorite anime not yet brought to the West and share them among their fellow enthusiasts. Early anime conventions would be a swap meet for different fan subbed anime recorded on VHS, leading to a wider variety of anime growing popular through word of mouth. Anime was starting to make its mark in Western audiences, but with the heavy westernization by American producers and the lack of distribution and poor quality of fan subs, the American audience wasn't seeing what the medium truly had to offer. That was until July 16th, 1988. Set in the cyberpunk world of 2019 Neo Tokyo, Akira portrays a military project using telekinetic children and the downfall of the project going out of control. The movie was breathtaking in animation, let alone the impact it had on pop culture in both Japan and the West. With a 1 billion yen budget, an unprecedented amount for an animated movie at the time, the passion for the medium can be felt in every frame. All backgrounds and animations were created by a team of nearly 70 top animators, using over 160,000 animation cells and 327 shades of color, 50 of which were created specifically for production. In the West, you can still see Akira inspirations everywhere. Kanye's music video Stronger, the skyscrapers of Coruscant in the Star Wars prequels, the telekinetic child story of Stranger Things, and the atmosphere of The Matrix, just to name a few. But what Akira really did was open a gate for anime in the West to not be westernized. Suddenly, this gripping, dark, and brutal genre of anime that was undeniably Japanese was taking the West by storm, and the gates were open for other anime to follow. But it was fans' dedication and influx of American money that followed Akira that got the attention of American producers. They saw that suddenly, at every major animation con and comic con, Akira was the hottest topic. Merchandise was selling out at an insane rate, Everybody wanted to meet the director, and this led to wanting to see other anime that Japan had to offer. To capitalize on the success of this, more anime movies were brought over to the West. Ghost in the Shell had a similar cyberpunk aesthetic, but only succeeded in gaining a cult following. Studio Ghibli was immensely popular in Japan, but had been badly burned from Nausicaa of the Valley of the Winds rampant westernization back in the 80s. With over 23 minutes cut from the original movie to reworking the promotional images to include a male-dominated cast, many of whom didn't even appear in the film. Hayao Miyazaki didn't allow his films to be translated to the West until a deal was struck with Disney in 1996. Princess Mononoke received moderate success, but opened a door for Studio Ghibli in the West. Anime in the early 90s had another advantage. The price and complexity of distributing via VHS had dropped drastically. This led to many small distributors being able to get into the anime industry, which meant that there was an influx of titles available for American audiences. In the early 90s, all sales pointed to be as brutal and violent as possible, with shows like Berserk and Fist of the North Star finding success. Distributors like Funimation and Manga Entertainment were trying to get the anime that can make them big, putting out shows like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and Neon Genesis Evangelion in the mid-90s. However, these shows failed to gain mass appeal when they were put in suboptimal time blocks usually in the early to mid-afternoon, and were heavily edited by censors. Anime like Dragon Ball Z lost 14 episodes to content restrictions, with most references to violence and religion either edited or entirely cut. However, the shows gained a small but dedicated following. Fans began distributing uncensored versions with fan subtitles, and word of mouth pushed the infamy of the shows. The fans were driving the anime industry behind the scenes, as distributors couldn't find the perfect blend of censorship and the original anime. That was 
until March 17th, 1997, when Cartoon Network released their flagship animation block, Toonami. Toonami was focused on taking its audience and creative content behind it seriously by limiting as much censorship as possible. Shows like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and Neon Genesis Evangelion were able to speak to the American audience directly. Jason DeMarco, the producer for Toonami, was quoted on bringing anime to the West. Look at this stuff that comes from other places. And look what artists are able to do in the medium and these stories that you didn't even imagine could be told in this format. For Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon, both were genre-defining shows. Dragon Ball Z's popularity grew through emotionally driven fight scenes, high stakes, and memorable characters. Sailor Moon's popularity grew through relatability. Usagi and the other Sailor Scouts were shown as powerful and feminine. Common feminine stereotypes in anime like makeup and painted nails were now shown to be powerful rather than fragile or naive. Neon Genesis Evangelion was one of the first deconstructional animes that became popular in the West, as it criticized the popularity of mech shows and the impact it would have in a harsher reality. The show tackled issues like depression and loneliness, and treated its audience like adults. Pokemon, however, went in the opposite direction. With the success of the game, the show was propelled into a colossal hit in terms of popularity and sales. The show was an instant success for young children, and has now become one of the highest net worth IPs in the world. Anime had now successfully diversified and became staples in different genres and age demographics in the West. For an entire generation, anime had now become a cultural cornerstone. With its immense popularity, westernization had been left behind for anime to leave its own cultural footprint in the West. With the introduction to a new millennium, the American producers looked to find its next big hit among three top anime, One Piece, Bleach, and Naruto. With over 470 million copies sold to date, One Piece is the biggest manga in Japan. However, due to an extremely poor handling of localization by 4Kids Entertainment, the distributor that brought Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh to the West, One Piece didn't find its Western audience until much later. 4Kids had acquired the license for One Piece without realizing the show involved blood, mature themes, and sexual innuendos, and decided to heavily edit the series to meet its younger demographic. This meant Guns were replaced with wacky inventions or water guns, and characters would go to the dungeon forever instead of dying. How about a nice room in a dungeon for the rest of your days? The censorship was very unpopular for Western viewers, a dramatic shift from the westernization practices of the past, and 4Kids eventually went bankrupt in 2012. Bleach, however, found much more success through a channel block called Adult Swim, an extension of Toonami's Midnight Run. Adult Swim followed Toonami's mantra of treating its audience and creative content with respect while creating its own cultural bubble. Bleach, which dealt with death and the afterlife, was very popular, but it was Cowboy Bebop that was the flagship for an Adult Swim's mature anime lineup. Cowboy Bebop was labeled as one of the gateways for anime in the early 2000s. At only 26 episodes, the show was broadcast on Adult Swim for four years repeatedly. Cowboy Bebop treated its audience as adults, pairing complex storylines with relatable characters. For any anime fans growing into adolescence, Cowboy Bebop was an instant classic. For younger anime fans, Pokemon and Naruto were exploding in popularity. Pokemon's international success was seen when the movie Mewtwo Strikes Back was released, breaking the record for the highest grossing opening for an animated movie at 172.7 million. Naruto was becoming successful through Dragon Ball Z's legacy, as it flourished in world building and strong choreographed fighting scenes. What helped Naruto flourish was a stable time block on TV channels like Cartoon Network and lack of heavy censorship from American producers. For Studio Ghibli, their partnership with Disney was starting to flourish. In 2002, Spirited Away came out and excelled in America, leading it to become the first anime movie to win an Oscar. From there, Studio Ghibli released more of their classic and new movies, from My Neighbor Totoro to Howl's Moving Castle. The animation studio showed Western audiences the depth that an anime movie could show, and became immensely popular because of it. As anime started to grow in popularity through the 2000s, a new technology shook the market, DVDs. DVDs allowed videos to not degrade over viewings, unlike VHS, and could contain multiple options, including English and Japanese dubs, and optional subtitles. It was very popular early on for anime distributors and fans in the West. As DVDs expanded and Blu-rays arrived, hardcore fans became the focus of anime distributors through large and expensive collector's editions. Casual fans, however, had to either watch the anime on cable channels or risk spending money on a full DVD set. This gap in the market was then filled by fan subs through the internet, which adversely led to an increase in piracy. 
In the 2000s, when fan subs started to appear on the internet, the anime was pirated, which meant it was free and much more convenient to watch. More and more consumers were watching anime online at the time, and distributors were stuck. They couldn't produce and export their product fast enough to beat the piracy, and the lack of revenue stream hurt the anime industry in the West. The solution to this problem wasn't introduced until the early 2010s with streaming services. The rise of streaming services like Crunchyroll, which itself started as a piracy website, allowed consumers to get content very quickly for a small fee, appealing to the casual consumer. Streaming provided an avenue to grow a hardcore fan base, which then led to an increased sales for collector's editions. Anime had now become a large influence for Western animation, and working alongside Western shows like The Simpsons or South Park helped pave the way for a wider and higher quality selection of animation aimed at the adult audience. In the 80s and 90s, American cartoons started to shift towards more serialized storytelling, while the 2000s saw an increased influence of Japanese animation-inspired shows, like Gargoyles, Teen Titans, Martin Mysteries, Totally Spies, The Boondocks, Megas XLR, Batman Beyond, Kappa Mikey, Samurai Jack, Winx Club, and Hi Hi Puffy Ami Yumi. One of the shows in the forefront of this was the story-driven and anime-influenced Avatar The Last Airbender. It started the conversation, what qualifies as anime? Japanese anime started challenging its own roots as well. Heavily influenced by the genre deconstruction of Neon Genesis Evangelion, shows like Attack on Titan, which took a grounded, brutal approach to violence, or Puella Magia Madoka Magica, which challenged conventions of magical girls such as Sailor Moon, all gained popularity. Yuri on Ice challenged what could be shown in an anime by embracing more LGBTQ plus characters instead of censoring them in the 80s and 90s. As recently as 2015, streaming platforms have started producing their own anime series, with Netflix shows like Eden, Castlevania, and Agretico, and Crunchyroll series like The God of High School. Working with Japanese animation studios, these streaming platforms are broadening the definition of what anime could be, with more hybrid American and Japanese collaborative works. Right now, anime has become more diverse than ever, and with streaming services, each anime is able to find its own audience. The medium of anime has expanded in the West to unprecedented heights, and the collaboration between Japan and America has become better than ever before. Anime is bigger than ever, represented by the astronomical success of the Demon Slayer movie. Released in Japan in late 2020, the movie has surpassed Titanic at the box office to become the territory's number two all-time hit, earning over 264 million in Japan, the top spot being Studio Ghibli's Spirited Away at 295 million. But it is important to note that with COVID, delays in production are everywhere in the industry. But what has grown is the collaboration between Japan and America, with more and more distributors and animation companies from both cultures working together on anime projects. What might be created in the next 5 or 10 years will be influenced by the collaborative efforts now, both in production and among fans. The start of a new chapter for anime culture could very well be just beyond the horizon. Hey, it's Stuart. Hope you really enjoyed the video. I gotta say that fitting an entire medium's impact and history into a 17-minute video means that some stuff gets cut, so if I missed your favorite anime, please let me know about it. There's a lot of great stuff out there, and honestly, I need something new for quarantine. My suggestion is Great Teacher Onizuka. You know, it's the show where this anime face is from. Amazing watch.